listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to www.nakedbibleblog.com. Welcome back to the Naked Bible Podcast. Today we're going to continue with our series on Bible study at the word level. In the last episode, we began talking about word study techniques. Specifically, we focused on examining word use by a single author throughout the material that author wrote. We looked at the case of the Apostle Paul's use of agameo in 1 Corinthians 7, where only Paul uses that term four times in that chapter, and those are the only four occurrences in the entire New Testament. Today, I want to talk about considering words in relationship to other words. A word study isn't just a matter of seeing how many times a word occurs. Math isn't part of exegesis. And then going to a lexicon and seeing which English gloss option you like best in a given passage. But that's what most people do. Word study is about word usage, and that takes thought and careful thought at that, based on careful observation. If you've listened to me for any length of time, you've probably heard me say that there is no substitute for thinking when doing Bible study. And that applies to word study. It's not about just lookups of word occurrences. That's just a step for getting the raw material that you need to think about. I want to illustrate this with the Hebrew word bara. The nuance and significance of bara can only be discerned by noting its use with respect to other words, specifically synonyms and the words that are used as bara's grammatical subject. Now I want to start by noting two familiar verses, Genesis 1.1 and Genesis 1.26. Now Genesis 1.1 is familiar. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word created there is the Hebrew word bara. And in Genesis 1.26, we get the familiar passage about the creation of humankind. The verse says, Then God said, Let us make man or humankind in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, so on and so forth. And then we get to verse 27. So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now we notice right away that in verse 27, we have created bara three times. What's really interesting, though, is that in the prior verse, verse 26, we have let us make man. That word is not bara. That verb there is asa. So what we have here is we have the creation of humankind spoken of by two terms, not just one. And that tells us that bara and asa are synonyms. They have some relationship. There's a there's some sort of congruence or similarity between them. There's something about them that they share in meaning. There's There also would be, in that sense, something a little bit different as well. Synonyms are, by definition, words that are similar in meaning, but they're not identical. Okay, there's always a little bit of a nuanced difference between terms. So right away we have learned that bara has at least one synonym. Now it's going to have more than that as well. So the very word that's used in Genesis 1.1 and then in Genesis 1.26 and 27, specifically verse 27, is going to have a synonym. Now that's going to become important because to really understand what bara means and doesn't mean, we have to take note of this. Now I've heard, again in my experience, things about bara that preachers or you know, Bible students or researchers or whatever have said uh, about this term. And they usually like to talk about how unique bara is, that specifically uh, it means creation out of nothing. And they'll usually reference Genesis 1-1 for that. You know, it's bara, it's a special creation. It's not just any normal creation. God speaks and it happens and it exists. It's creation out of nothing. 
Well, that actually doesn't work. And that actually isn't true about bara. And we've gotten our first clue, believe it or not, by looking at Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Now we've seen in verse 27 that bara is used of the creation of humankind. It also has a synonym, asa. Now, why is that a clue? Well, let me just ask you a really simple question. Again, if those of you who've uh, you know, been doing any Bible study for any, any amount of time are probably going to know the answer to this immediately. The simple question is this. Were humans created out of nothing? The answer to that is very obviously no. That isn't true. If you go to Genesis 2, we get another account of the creation of humankind. In that chapter, we read, for instance, in verse 7, Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed the man from the soil of the ground. Okay, formed here in Genesis 2, 7 is not bara, and it's not asa, it's actually an, a, another Hebrew word, yatsar. But we wouldn't even really have to know that. We're, we just read the verse. God is forming the man in the text from something, mainly dirt, okay, the soil of the ground. The man is not created out of nothing. The man is created from something. And the same goes with the woman. And this is important because Genesis 1.27 talks about God uh, baraing humankind, male and female. So if we look in Genesis 2, verse 22, the Lord God made a woman from the part he had taken out of the man. Okay, so right away we also learn that the woman is also not created out of nothing. She's created from something. Now what this tells us, if we take Genesis 1, 26 and 27 and Genesis 2, uh, verse 7 and verse 22, if we take all that together, We've seen now that there are three words that describe the creation of humankind. One of them is bara, another is asa, and the third one is yatsar. They are synonyms. Okay? They have some similarity, but they also have some nuance of difference as well. Very clearly, bara does not mean in and of itself to create out of nothing. This is a myth, okay, that's been sort of perpetuated by some, uh, again, well-meaning Bible students that really just didn't even bother to think very carefully about the word and the word's use, and the word's use specifically for our episode today in relationship to other words. Now you say, well, what about Genesis 1? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I mean, surely, uh, the use of bara there refers to creation out of nothing, right? Well, I've actually done a lot of, uh, of work on this passage that is accessible to uh, people who are not scholars. And on the podcast website under Bibliography and Resources, I will link uh, to some video uh, of me talking about this. But Genesis 1, 1 through 3 uh, is actually highly you know argued about highly debated highly disputed as far as what is actually being described there i personally and i'm with the majority here i try to be with mainstream scholarship i mean i'm not always there i'm not afraid to not be there but in this case with genesis 1 1 through 3 most scholars uh, of hebrew syntax okay hebrew grammar would note that Genesis 1, 1 to 3 actually does not describe uh, a creation out of nothing. It, it depends on how you take the clauses of the first three verses. And that's well beyond our subject for this podcast. But if you go to those videos uh, that I've made and linked on the podcast Bibliography and Resources site, you'll be able to watch a full explanation of this that I think is very digestible, again, for someone who doesn't uh, even know Hebrew or Hebrew grammar. Uh, it's something I've presented in, in, in church several times, and I think you'll be able to follow it. What you have in Genesis 1, 1 through 3, is that God is actually uh, creating, the, the creative act, okay, let there be light, actually comes it with respect to material that is already pre-existing. 
uh, something you know that's already there. Now, theologically, we would affirm that, hey, God put that there too. But, you know, we don't really get that in Genesis 1. We get that from other passages. Again, watch the video and that, that'll be explained to you what I'm talking about there. But for our purposes here, it's kind of interesting that we have in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, the heavens and the earth barad, okay, created. And you would think, again, that that means creation out of nothing. But we've seen that bara is used elsewhere where it very clearly does not mean creation out of nothing. So is this consistent? Well, again, you can see the videos uh, for how Genesis 1, 1 through 3 really does not, uh, in terms of Hebrew grammar, does not tell us that we have a creation out of nothing here in Genesis 1.1, but I want to just show you something that you would probably miss. In reality, the heavens and the earth elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible are described as being made and not barad. In other words, there are other verbs of creative activity that are used to produce the heavens and the earth and those words are not bra. They're normal words of making things and creating things out of pre-existing material. We actually kind of saw or alluded to one of them already. Genesis 2, 4. Now, we were in Genesis 2, and we looked at verse 7, where the God formed the man from the dust of the ground, Yatsar. And we said, hey, when you take that in parallel to Genesis 1, 26, it's very clear that since Genesis 2 has humankind being created from something and not out of nothing, that we can't understand bara as speaking of creation out of nothing back in Genesis 1.26. Well, the same thing can be said for the heavens and the earth, because if you go to verse 4 in Genesis 2, we read, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Okay, right there we have bara, but the verse isn't done yet. Heavens and earth, when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. There we have Asa. It's the same tandem parallel, again, Asa and Bara, that we saw for the creation of humankind. Now, this isn't the only place. Exodus 20, verse 4, has the heavens and the earth being asad. Okay, the verse is asa there. or the, Excuse me, the word is asa for the production, the producing of the heavens and the earth. Exodus 20, verse 11. Exodus 31, 17. There's a whole bunch of these. There's almost two dozen instances where the heavens and the earth are not barad. They are brought into existence through another term that you know, isn't quote unquote as special as bara. It's just the generic word, the generic verb that would be used hundreds and hundreds of times in the Hebrew Bible for making things out of materials. So the heavens and the earth of Genesis 1 are spoken of in the same way by the same verb, despite the fact that in one one the verb happens to be bara. Bara and asa are synonyms, and asa very clearly uh, does not involve any sense of creation out of nothing. So again, we need to be looking at how the Bible itself uses terminology. Uh, and not, again, trying to defend a particular view of origins or of creation. Again, even the pre-existing material in Genesis 1, I would argue that other passages you know, require us to, to see that God is the originator of that material, too. The point is just that Genesis 1 itself doesn't tell us how that material got there. It's just there, and then God starts to work with it. Again, watch the video about the clauses in, Hebrew, in uh, Genesis 1, 1 through 3, and you'll get a better understanding of what I'm saying here. I don't want a rabbit trail on it for the sake of the podcast. Now, We've just looked at bara in relationship to other words, again, synonyms, and that helps us to inform, uh, to be informed about what bara means and doesn't mean. It, it, it means creation, it means to bring something in, into being, but it doesn't mean necessarily that that creation is out of nothing, okay? It is quite supportable to say that even bara involves 
the creative act with pre-existing material. Okay, so we've learned that much. So you say, well, well, what's the big deal about bara then? What, is there anything unique about it? There actually is. Now, what I'm going to tell you and suggest that you do here would be very easy with Bible software such as uh, Logos, where I work, uh, my employer produces. In fact, this is pretty unique. Uh, we don't have uh, any competition here. There are no other other software packages that it can do what I'm going to describe for you here. But what you need to determine, what you need to discover, again, if you have software, it's easy. If you don't, it's a little harder. But bara doesn't occur that many times, so you could do this by hand in a reasonable amount of time. We need to determine what the grammatical subject of bara is. In other words, in all of Barah's uses, and there are roughly 50, a little, little less than 50 of them. So you, again, you could do it by hand if you wanted to. If you got a list of all the places where Barah occurs, look for what does the action. What Barah's what, okay? Who is the creator? Okay, who's the grammatical subject of the verb bara? This is actually where bara is unique because in all the occurrences, every occurrence where it's used in the Hebrew Bible, only God is the grammatical subject of bara. What that means is that while other verbs of creation like asa and yatsar, uh, a whole range of subjects are used with them because, hey, humans can asa and yatsar and you know, an animal can, you know, quote unquote, make its young, you know, what, what, however it's used, you get a variety of subjects that are used with the other verbs of creation. That does not happen with bara. The grammatical subject of bara is always and only God. And what that means is if you're the biblical writer, if you want to make the special point that, look, I'm going to describe an act of creation here that only God could do, you would use bara. And that's what happens in Genesis 1.1. That's what happens in Genesis 1.26. Even though other verbs are used that very clearly involve creation with pre-existing material, the point of bara is not, did God use anything to create? The point of bara is that only God could do this thing that I'm describing. But you'd only get that if you, again, were able to get a list of all the occurrences where bara appears, where it's used, and then you looked at them and did a little grammar, did a little English grammar, looked at what the grammatical subjects were for that verb, for your study of bara. Again, with, with software, this just takes seconds, but you could do this kind of thing yourself. And my point is that when you study a word, you need to think about it in terms of its relationship to other words that might involve looking at synonyms and it might involve looking at some grammar. We could also look at what is the object of bara. You know, what are the things that get barad as opposed to the subject, the, the, the person or entity doing the creating, doing the bara-ing, if I could say it that way. Again, you have, to, you have to start thinking about words the way they're used in sentences and also with respect to synonyms. And it's a, it, it involves a lot more than just getting a list, checking it twice, okay, and, oh, my words used X number of times in the Old Testament or New Testament or Bible. Well, great. What do you do with that? Again, that's a nice little piece of trivia that, that you've, you've accumulated to yourself. Uh, usually people do that kind of thing, maybe to put in a sermon. Maybe it has some effect. Uh, maybe it shows that your congregation that you're studying something. But then people will open up a lexicon and look at all the ways that in English, you know, English sort of synonyms, th th it's a thesaurus approach. Well, what other English words could I use besides create uh, for this word? And, oh, well, that, that one sounds good here. That, that sort of breaks up the monotony. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that meaning. Okay, that is not doing word study. Doing word study involves looking at how a word is used where it occurs, again, in relationship to other words, which involve synonyms and some grammar. So until next time, I hope that this is helpful to get you down the road to doing some real word study.
Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.